Well, good morning. You seem very far away. <laughs> yeah, I could. Um, well, I'll stay here because I'm parked here now, but um, my name's Doug. Uh, most of you know me, but uh, for those of you who don't, uh, that is my name, and I have a bit of a history with uh, Creekside that is uh, kind of a special season of my life. So Jeremy once in a while does ask me to come back and to speak, and uh, this summer I think people have been speaking on perhaps their favorite psalm. Uh, so I will be doing that. But I want to say, I was here last week as well, and I want to say a thank you uh, to Morley uh, for the message that he really was a testimony of his life and the graciousness of God to him in a, in a life that uh, was a challenging life. And so, Morley, I thank you for being open and honest with us as a church. And uh, I think it did many hearts good to hear what you had to say. So, and then last week, uh, uh, Chris was leading and he made reference to, I think, being on a hike with Calum on the West Coast Trail. And he said when they were hiking, there was a psalm that came to his mind. And even before he started reading the psalm, I thought, you know what? I'm pretty sure he's going to talk about Psalm 19. And sure enough, he read the first section of Psalm 19, which is an incredible just declaration of God spread out in the world before us. Um, and that's the psalm I want to spend a few minutes talking about this morning. You know, I think uh, the question of God, and even the question of God's existence, um, has always been somewhat central to the human experience. The question of why does anything that exists, why does it exist? Like, how is it that we're here? I remember even as a teenager, I can remember driving in, in my car and at times just being overwhelmed with this thought about, why am I here? Like, I'm in this car, driving along this road, and I know that I am like a, a dot a little speck in this planet we call Earth. And I think, well, how did any of this happen? We know that there are other planets around us, and pretty much the ones we know about, they're either barren, far too hot, far too cold, and yet somehow we are here. To me, it was a question, even as a teenager, that always caused me to draw near to God. Now, some people would say that, you know, the, that question is not really a God question. But I think others would say that's exactly what it is. I mean, we intuitively know that we are not the designers of this universe. We didn't create it. In fact, you might say we had nothing to do with it. So something or someone else did. And Psalm 19 is a beautiful declaration that our world is the handiwork of God. And not only has God created the world in which we live, and as much as some of you maybe didn't like yesterday, because it was a bit chilly and it was wet, 
and I think it was even wet and stormy the night before. Uh, I have to say, <laughs> I thought it was such a good thing that we were getting this incredible rain. And this morning, when I opened up the curtains, I thought, oh, the sun is out. But it was as if God had washed everything and have given it exactly what it needs. And David in Psalm 19 would say that not only has God created our world, he has also established how we ought to live out the lives that we have been given. And the songs this morning all seem to talk about us drawing close to God, of yearning for him, that he is a God who wants to walk with us, and he is a God who wants us to choose to walk with him, to give him glory, to give him praise, to stand in awe of everything that he has created, and then to say, God, I will bow before you with my own life. And I'll seek to live as you would have me live. I mean, if you think humanity will eventually figure out its problems, I think David would challenge that assumption and say, well, that's hopeful, but it's very wishful thinking. The chapter, I think, in essence says, pause, take a look around you, and give careful thought to what you see. And then it says, pause, take a look inside you, and take careful thought of what you see. And ultimately, what you see should cause us to consider and embrace the reality of God. He is the potter. We are the clay. His desire is to mold us into his image. It's what David, Psalm 19 is all about, and it's David in this moment of ref inspired reflection, giving voice to the reality of a very personal, very trustworthy God. Now, someone has said that being in awe of creation does not bring one to belief or faith in Jesus, that that requires something deeper. And perhaps that is true, but I would argue that creation, at the very least, is meant to draw us to the God who created us. That creation is not stagnant, creation is speaking to us. In Psalm 19, in poetic, very positive, and creative language essentially says that without uttering a word, without making a single noise, creation, day after day, is speaking out the glory and reality of God. And that creation speaks a very universal language regardless of what country you live in, regardless of what language you speak, all humanity is hearing the voice of God in their own language through what God has created. It's kind of like the story of Pentecost when people from all over heard the disciples speak, and they said, and they heard it in their own language. Creation is also the universal voice of God. 
speaking in a language everyone throughout the world can understand. That when we are at a loss to describe the sheer beauty spread out before us, it's partly because we are witnessing the glory of God on display. And it explains, I think, the deep loss we felt as a nation when we saw what occurred in Jasper. Now, I, I don't know for you, but for me, I was deeply touched by what I saw happen in that beautiful little city, town. And it's because Jasper is such an incredible display of what Psalm 19 is talking about. The heavens proclaim the glory of God. The skies display his craftsmanship, and day after day, they continue to speak. Night after night, they make him known. They speak without a sound or word. The voice is never heard. Yet their message has gone throughout the earth and their words to all the world. God has made a home in the heavens for the sun, and it bursts forth like a radiant bridegroom after his wedding. It's such interesting language. The sun rejoices like a great athlete eager to run the race, rises at one end of the heavens and follows its course to the other end. Nothing can hide from its heat. For those who love the beauty of nature, and it seems to me like most people do, but deny its creator, I can't help but think there must always be this nagging question in the back of their mind as to how did this all come to be? For those who acknowledge God, as creator, when we soak in what we can see, what he has made, we at the very same time are embracing the God who made it. O oh Lord my God, when I an awesome wonder, consider all the worlds thy hand has made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout all the universe displayed. This is what it's supposed to do to us. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. That's the first section of Psalm 19. And I think it's awesome. And then it's as if David completely changes gears. And he starts talking about the commandments, the law, the judgments, the precepts, the statutes, the instructions of God. And it seems like such a, wow, you really have changed topics here. But I don't think that's what's happening. It's as if David has made his case for God in creation, saying God is there. You can see it with your eyes. And now he says, let me tell you more about this God who made the heavens and the earth. Let me tell you about his divine character. Let me tell you about his heart for you. Someone made in his image. In Romans chapter 1, Paul kind of um, mirrors 
what David has been talking about when he said this. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood through what he has been made so that they are without excuse. And if you say, who's, who's the they? Well, it would be people who deny him, those who reject him. Professing to be wise, they became fools. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. David is saying, you need to worship the creator. David affirms that our lives are meant to be lived in relationship to the one who gave us life. To deny him is to pretend that the creature is somehow superior to the creator. That somehow the clay can call the shots rather than the potter. The Bible calls that thinking foolishness. David argues that in order for us to live well, God has established, you might say, the rules of engagement. In terms of living out your life, here are the rules of engagement. And this whole section could be picked apart. That commandments mean this, laws mean this, judgments mean this. I'm not going to do that. But I am going to suggest that this whole section, written in a very kind of repetitive style or format, simply different ways of saying the same thing. In order to emphasize a point. And the point is that God is perfect. God is trustworthy. God is pure. God is true. That when it comes to living life, the instructions of God exist in order that we might flourish. In order that we might live well, they are not meant to restrict us, but rather to protect us from what happens when we bow to the creature and not the creator. Most of the problems of our world result in bowing to the creature and not bowing to the creator. The statutes, the instructions, the guidelines of God are meant for our benefit, not to our detriment. Ask any of the millions of prodigals. Even to this day, whose desire for freedom have only resulted in despair and bondage. Now Val, if you can put that chart back up, I just want to make a couple of comments. When you look at the center column, and depending on what translation you read, it, it might have slightly different words. The center column speaks to the divine nature of God. It's David saying, this is who God is. And if you look at the right-hand side of that chart, the right-hand side of that chart expresses God's heart for you. And that column looks pretty good to me.
to revive the soul, to make wise the simple. And there is an entire message that you could speak on that truth. Bringing joy to the heart. That's God's heart for you and for me. And I want to say this morning that when David was writing this, not all of this book existed. But I would say this morning that whether it's the teaching of Jesus, whether it's the example of Jesus' life laid out for us here, whether it's the words of the prophets who spoke into the nation of Israel, whether it's the commandments of God that he gave in the Old Testament, all of it, this book, is what David is talking about. His commandments, his laws, his precepts, his guidelines, his instructions. And they reflect God's design for how we should engage with the life that he has given us. And rather than fight against them, rather than question them or ignore them, we should strive even in our imperfect way to embrace the instructions and guidelines of God. And David says, you know what? We need to treasure them. We need to treasure them. As the deer pants for water, in essence, that song is about this. The instructions of the Lord are perfect, reviving the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The commandments of the Lord are right, bringing joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are clear, giving insight for living. Reverence for the Lord is pure, lasting forever. The laws of the Lord are true. Each one is fair. They are more desirable than gold. Even the finest gold. They are sweeter than honey. Even honey dripping from the comb. And then he says, they are a warning to your servants. David says, they are a warning to me, but they are a great reward for those who obey them. And then David takes a quick look inside his own heart and life. And David essentially says, well, I believe everything I just wrote. I believe that God created the heavens and the earth and, and the majesty and glory of God is on display there. I believe that. I also believe everything that this chart says about the divine nature of God and I believe that God's heart is that I would flourish. And yet at the same time, there is something within me that tends to pull me in a different direction. Today we might say, David is very self-aware. He is under no illusion that in any way, shape, or form he is without blame. Knowing full well that God has our best interests in mind, we still struggle to embrace his instructions because we have a tendency to be drawn away by our own desires, sometimes just by our own impulses. 
and sometimes even because of our limited intellect, that sometimes we allow our limited intellect to draw us away from God. And David is acutely aware of that in his own life. Not simply the struggle with willful, intentional, rebellious sin. Pretty much all of us can probably point to that in our own life. And we wouldn't have to look too far back in our life to say, yes, God, that guilty a hundred times over. But he says the truth is that there are flaws in his life that he is not even aware of. And in a sense, David says, who of us thinks we are so intuitive that we know ourselves inside out? And the answer is, not a single one of us. Sometimes you say, well, I know, I know that like the back of my hand. And the truth is, I know very little about the back of my hand. David says, I know there are sins that I struggle with. They're overt, they're intentional. But I also know that within my heart and soul, there is sin that I may not even be aware of. And the truth is, even if we could peer into our own lives and identify every one of our flaws, not a single one of us would have the wherewithal to remedy them, remedy them all. So David says, how can I know all the sins lurking in my heart. And he says, cleanse me from these hidden faults. And keep your servant from deliberate sins. Don't let them control me. Wow, what a, what a powerful sentence. And then I will be free of guilt and innocent of great sin. You know, this is the, the reflection, it's almost like a prayer of a very humble, honest, and imperfect man before a perfect, a just, righteous, a pure, eternal God. And it needs to be our prayer and our confession. But you know, our God is also a gracious, merciful, compassionate, and loving God. Yes, he is a God who revealed himself in creation. Yes, he is a God who revealed himself in his word. But ultimately, he is a God who revealed himself in the person of Jesus. The Bible says the word became flesh and dwelt among us and he was full of grace and full of truth. He's talking about Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God. Jesus who loves us and gave himself for us in order that we might become the children of God. The very God that David has spoken so poetically about in Psalm 19. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burdens gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. This psalm has always spoken so directly to me. 
It's a psalm that draws me to God every time I read it. That my life, our lives, will find a degree of rest and peace, of life and joy, of purpose and meaning that the world cannot take away and the world cannot duplicate. And I want to encourage you to make this a go-to psalm. <laughs> you know, sometimes I think about, okay, for people to ask about the Christian faith, about God, about, you know, what passages kind of, in a fairly simple, short form, spell it out. Well, this psalm to me spells it out. Print it out, put it up someplace, put it on your phone, and read it often. And then David ends with this, and I'll, I'll use this simply as my prayer at the end. May the words of my mouth and the meditations, the thoughts of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O God, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen.